Hey, I've got a question for you. What does the Holy Spirit actually do? And, and let's face it, maybe you've even heard the Holy Spirit called something different. Maybe you've heard it call, be called the, the Holy Ghost or like it's like a dove or it's, it's the presence of God. And maybe you're saying, I, I mean, I don't really know anything about it. what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, today, Pastor Eric is going to be giving us five things that the Holy Spirit does. And in just a moment, I also want to give you some details on how you can take your next step in a small group this fall. Thank you for being here today and welcome to SMCC Online. joining Pastor Eric and the rest of our locations as we talk about the Holy Spirit today in, in just a moment, but I wanna give you a few details on a next step that you might want to take. Now here at SMCC, we think that you can belong before you believe. And, and part of belonging before you believe is just getting to know others and connecting with them. And maybe you're here online today uh, because of a few different reasons. Maybe you're checking out uh, the church. Maybe you've got questions about God or faith. Maybe you're planning to, to move here to Utah soon. Or, or maybe your work schedule just doesn't allow you to be here on a Sunday morning. Maybe your work schedule is all over the place and so you, you try to make do with what you can. Regardless of the reason that you are here, I think that there's something very important. We don't want to just be engaging our, our minds and our head with just a, a message, but we also want people to be engaging with their hearts and connecting with people and understanding how to love them better. And so that's why we have small groups. Small groups allow that to happen, to get together and to connect with other people and learn how to love others better. And for you, you might say, hey, a small group just doesn't work for me because I just do not have the time my schedule to make it work. I just can't make it physically. I'm just, I'm just gone all the time. Maybe that's you. We've got a new option that we would love for you to try out if this is something that you're interested in. It's gonna be a small group, one small group that we're gonna have that is online. It's gonna be hosted by two great people that attend our Draper campus, and it's gonna be happening this fall starting September 11th. And that'll actually be a small group that starts on that Sunday, September 11th at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And so if you say, hey, that sounds interesting to me, I've just never tried a small group before because it didn't were for my schedule, I couldn't ever make it to it. That's why I'm watching online. Hey, we get it and I wanna give this new option to you. So if you say, yes, this new option might be something that I'm interested in, I wanna tell you about how to let me know. I'll personally reach out to you and be able to talk with you about joining this small group. So all I need you to do is go to smccutah.org, go to our next steps tab. And on that next steps page, there is a button, the connect button there. And that's a short, really short form that you fill out, but you can just fill out that form quickly and just type in the notes box, hey, I'd like to know more about an online small group. If you do that for me, I will personally reach out to you and make sure that I, I get all your questions answered, that I can get you connected to the group leaders that you can participate in that next step of not just engaging your mind, but also engaging your heart and loving others better. We're now going to transition while you're thinking about that. We're going to go ahead and transition into our time with Pastor Eric talking about the Holy Spirit with the rest of our locations this week. So let's go ahead and join Eric and everyone else now. God himself, the ancient of days, the God who was there before time had a name, the God that keeps his universe on track to show us that he's running things, reigning supreme, chose to put on human clothes. He put his back on the line so our nature would be put back in line with his He So out the backwash of our sins for our sake, his back was placed on a cross. When the sky turned black, the father turned his back on his son's face. Tears began to run back into her eyes. His eyes began to roll back into his face. The preacher continued to tell them how Christ stayed in the cave for three days and proceeded to backslap death in the face from the grave. He got raised like a backward sunset and that anyone that wanted forgiveness for their wicked ways just had to call on Jesus' name and they would be saved. Well, hey, I'm Eric, and I uh, just want to welcome you in to SMCC online. I don't, know, I don't know if you tune in all the time or this is your first time, but uh, really glad that we can be together. We are in the middle of a series about doctrine. 
We've been talking about the what and the why of the core beliefs of SMCC that really serve as the foundation for all that we do. And what we've been saying in this series is that everybody has a doctrinal statement for their life. Everybody has a core set of values or beliefs that guide their life. Everybody turns somewhere or goes to something to be uh, informed in their beliefs. And I wanna talk about that now because we have not talked about where most people go to discover their beliefs. So I wanna begin with that thought. Most people turn to one place. I think it's the most popular place to go when it comes to discovering and finding out what it is that you believe. Most people turn to their feelings or to their experiences. That is to say their story, feelings, experiences together equals story. They turn to their story to discover what it is that they believe. So I wanna introduce you to a type of doctrine today that I think is most popular in our culture. I call it anecdotal doctrine. An anecdotal doctrine is this. It's a set of beliefs that you have formed from the stories in your life. A fancy word for belief is doctrine. A fancy word for story is anecdote. So anecdotal doctrine is a core set of beliefs that you have because of all the things you've gone through, all the things that you have experienced. And um, here's what it sounds like in the real world. It sounds like this. Prayer works because of that one time win. <laughs> this is someone who says, I believe prayer works. I believe in prayer because one time I was praying for this and this thing happened. So based on my anecdote, based on my story, I now have this belief. Here's another one. God doesn't exist because of that one time win. There was this one time I was praying and this one time I really needed God and I went through that really hard thing. And because I didn't see what I wanted to see and God didn't show up like I wanted him to show up because of my story and what I've gone through, I don't believe there's a God. That's anecdotal doctrine. How about this one? There are angels because of that one time when. One time I was in this moment and this thing happened and this other thing over here and I just, it had to have been an angel. I believe there are angels because of what I've experienced. This is experiences shaping your belief. I call it anecdotal doctrine. Here's one more. God does exist because of that one time when. One time in my life I was going through this thing and I prayed and God did this. Or one time I was in this dangerous spot and I needed God to come through and then this happened. So based on what happened there, I believe in a God. This is anecdotal doctrine. It's your story, your experience, and your feeling shaping your belief. I call it anecdotal doctrine or AD for short. And let me say this, it is the heresy of our day. Now, I know why this is so popular. Guys, what we go through, it is so real and it is so raw. As people, what we experience, it is so powerful and it is so personal. And what we go through, I mean, it just, it just sticks deep within us, imprints on our hearts, imprints on our lives. And therefore, because it's so real and because it's so impactful, we are tempted to shape our whole belief system, our whole worldview system because of what we've experienced. Now, I want to ask you a question to help you assess how vulnerable you might be when it comes to anecdotal doctrine, how tempting anecdotal doctrine might be for you. Here's the question. Do you evaluate your story by your beliefs or do you evaluate your beliefs by your story? This might sound like a bit of a weird question, uh, but hang with me for just a moment. What I mean is this, what comes first for you? Is it your experiences, your story and your feelings that are more important than your belief system? Do those come before belief or is it that your worldview, truth matters more than what you experience in your feelings? So it's actually truth that helps you interpret all that you go through. At the end of the day, which is more important to you? Your feelings or the facts? Your feelings or your worldview? Or is it your worldview that shapes all of what you experience, helps you interpret all of that? Now, let me take you to the courtroom for just a moment to make sense of this. Uh, in a courtroom, anecdotal evidence, uh, it matters. But as compared to other types of evidence, it is limited. And that's because anecdotal evidence is at the mercy of cognitive bias. It is easy to cherry pick the details of a story, any story or your story that support your preferred conclusion. Your preferred conclusion, of course, being what you already think is true because of what you've gone through. Anecdotal evidence, it is limited in a courtroom and anecdotal doctrine should not be our approach to life. We need a better authority than that. Your story matters. But what really matters is that you have an authority that helps you understand and interpret all that you're experiencing. 
More than that, you need an authority that shapes your story. And I wanna talk about that today. The best authority for your story. So in this series, we've talked about a few things. In week one, we talked about the Bible. Uh, in week two, we talked about the Trinity. And in week three, we talked about salvation in Jesus alone. Today, we're up to the fourth doctrinal statement we have at SMCC. And I wanna read it to you. Here it is. We believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit by whose indwelling the Christian is enabled to live a godly life. When this core conviction is a part of your everyday life, it drastically changes your story. We're talking today about the role in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Christians believe in the Holy Spirit, not because it sounds good, makes them feel good. It's because this is what Jesus taught. It's what the Bible says. This is not anecdotal doctrine. This is biblical doctrine. And the Holy Spirit shapes the story deeply, shapes the story of every Christian. And I wanna show you exactly how he, the Holy Spirit, does that today. So in the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is in this very important farewell discourse with his followers. It's uh, towards the end of the Gospel of John. And Jesus does a lot in that conversation to prepare them, to prepare us to follow him. And at one point he talks and he promises uh, the Holy Spirit. I wanna read this to you, John 14. Jesus says this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you help and be with, present, be with you forever. Jesus, who's that advocate? Jesus gives us the answer, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, that's very important, that pronoun, accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, Jesus, how will we know him? For he lives with you and he will be in you. This is pretty clear. We see that a personal God, the Holy Spirit, will live in and help forever those who follow Jesus. Now, the word for spirit here uh, is a very important Greek word. It's the word pneuma. I wanna break that down in a little bit. And the word for advocate here is very important as well. It is the word paraclete. And perhaps you've heard uh, that before used to describe the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Paraclete is a Greek word that uh, is difficult to translate into English because there's not one English word that makes sense of all that paraclete is. Paraclete means helper, advocate, counselor, and comforter. And it's a bit hard to translate because paraclete comes from two Greek words put together, para, which means alongside, and, uh, and kaleto or cleat, the one who is called. So the paraclete is the one who is called alongside to help, to comfort, to be someone's advocate, to fight on your behalf. It is the word paraclete. And the implication is that this advocate will support and empower every Jesus follower. This is what Jesus is saying. And then later on in the Gospel of John, what Jesus promised happens because of course he comes through on every one of his promises. So in John chapter 20 now, we see this. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This is after the resurrection. Jesus is sending out his followers. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus says it's gonna happen earlier in John. And Jesus breathes on the disciples this moment, this powerful moment where they then receive the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, the Greek word, like I said, for spirit is pneuma here. And it means immaterial being, immaterial being. Being. This is very, very important that we understand immaterial being. There are some beings who have material, who have bodies. You and I, we're beings with bodies. But um, there are also immaterial beings. This is who the Holy Spirit is. Now, uh, what I think is very interesting is this. Out of all the modern English translations of the Bible, it is only the King James Version of the Bible that uses a different word for spirit. And perhaps you grew up with this word in your church setting. Uh, it's the word Ghost. They translate pneuma to ghost. And this is an interesting conversation. I want to think about this together for a little bit. Uh, the King James translates ghost, uh, uses ghost 90 times to translate spirit. Seven times pneuma is translated spirit. I'm not quite sure why the, the translators or the editors of the KJV, King James Version, uh, go 90 times with ghost and only seven with spirit. But there's an interesting interaction here. When they use ghosts, they are not trying to talk about the spirit of a deceased 
person. That's not it at all. A few hundred years ago, ghost was an appropriate word for an immaterial immaterial being. It would be so weird to talk about Jesus' deceased spirits showing up on the scene and that would make no sense to what the New Testament talks about. But during the time of Shakespeare, when the KJV was being compiled, ghost meant immaterial being. It comes from the Latin word ghost and the KJV is translated from a Latin translation of the Bible. However, we can go back further than that. We can go back into Greek. We don't have to go to Latin. We can go back to Greek and see the word spirit, which means immaterial being. Uh, and so when we translate pneuma, we translate it to spirit because it gets at the core of the word. So over the last 300 years or so, ghost has gone from meaning immaterial being to something about a deceased person. That's where we land. And spirit has gone from something, you know, in the olden days that didn't mean immaterial being to really communicating the the core essence of a person, even like soul. And so over the last 300, 400 years, there's been this change in language and evolution in language, which language is changing all the time. And so if you're wondering, uh, Why does SMCC use Holy Spirit and not Holy Ghost? It's because Spirit makes the best sense. Spirit is the best translation of the word pneuma. In our world today, ghost means something different. So we don't use it. We think Holy Spirit is far clearer, a much better translation. So what we should be very clear about is this. The Holy Spirit is a person, not a feeling. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal power, but a very powerful person. Not a force, not a feeling, not some ooze, not divine energy, but a person. Jesus uses that third person pronoun, he or him, to describe the Holy Spirit. And if all that is a little bit complicated, let me give it to you in the way that I like to remember it. The way that is very, very helpful. It is the Holy Spirit who is a person who makes following Jesus as a Christian incredibly personal. Let's face it, people have asked this question, you know what, it'd be a lot easier uh, if I could follow Jesus if he was right in front of me, where, where is he now? I understand that. Christianity can seem you're following a 2000 year old uh, kind of story, this person who was raised to life, how can this be personal? Because of the personal ministry of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, Christianity is oh so personal. Now, for the rest of the message, I wanna talk about the five primary roles the Holy Spirit has now in the life of a Christian. Five roles. Um, I, I want you to know it's a bit cheesy, but they all start with C. Sometimes pastors work really hard to alliterate. These C's just came pretty quickly. And if it can help you remember them in any way, I think that's helpful. So five C's, here we go. Here's the first C and really the first role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit combats, combats our sinful character. Back at that discussion in John, Jesus says this. When he comes, Jesus is now talking about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people don't believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Another word for this proved to be in the wrong is the word uh, convict or conviction. And conviction is different from guilt. Conviction is this process where we uh, are convinced that we're wrong about something and then we need to agree and align our lives with something else. And the Holy Spirit does this. He, He combats our sinful nature, convicts us of our sinful nature. This is the role of the Holy Spirit, the first role. Letting us know that there is something incredibly broken inside of each of us. Letting us know that that brokenness cannot be fixed by us. Letting us know that we have this deep persuasion towards self-glorification rather than submission to the one we should be glorifying. And there is a day for every Christian where they become aware of that. Aware of the deep brokenness inside of us. The awareness of sin. And that deep conviction uh, is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit combats our sinful character by making us aware of our wrong. Our wrong about sin, we read that. Our wrong about judgment, we read that. Our wrong about righteousness and how to pursue it. And so the Holy Spirit combats our sinful nature by convicting us of our sin. He, He continually reminds us we need a Savior. And the Holy Spirit, He continually reminds us 
that we have a Savior. So when you begin to follow Jesus, there will be times where you might feel worse about yourself than you did before because you are coming face to face with the sinfulness inside of you. That is a good thing because that is the good work of the Holy Spirit bringing to light, making us aware of our sin, making us agree, <laughs> leading us to agree with God's goodness so that we would submit all the more to Jesus. So the Holy Spirit, first role is to combat our sinful character. Here's another role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convinces us of truth, convinces us of what is true. Later on in that same discussion, Jesus is still describing the role in the ministry of the Holy Spirit when he says this. He says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it's from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So the Holy Spirit clarifies what Jesus taught. The Holy Spirit speaks what Jesus has already spoken. Here's an easy way to remember it. What Jesus supplies in terms of truth, the Holy Spirit applies in the life of a Christian. That's what Jesus is describing. This is called illumination. What we see here in John and what we see in the rest of the New Testament is the Holy Spirit isn't out to bring new information to people in new ways. That's not it. It's not new information at all. It's to take what Jesus has already said and make it incredibly clear. Not new information, but using an existing information from Jesus, truth from him that already exists to convince us, to convict us, persuade us and enable us to trust and follow after Jesus. There's a lot of people who think when the Holy Spirit's really at work, there's some chaos going on. It's a bit mystical and it's magical and there's some secret information. If you have all that, the Holy Spirit's really blessing you and really at work. That is not what we see in John. The Holy Spirit is not communicating new things. The Holy Spirit is bringing illumination, which can mean new insight into all the truth that Jesus has already spoken. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. It's to bring clarity the Holy Spirit is bringing clarity to all that Jesus has said and all that Jesus is. Illumination, another way to talk about it is to say the Holy Spirit has a floodlight ministry. I wanna describe this to you with a quick picture. I wanna throw a picture up on the screen. Uh, this is the Washington Monument at night. Perhaps you've been there. It's an incredible piece of architecture. But here's what I think is so fascinating. This beautiful piece of architecture, we can only see it at night for what it is because of the, the, the lights, the, the many lights that are, that are lighting it up. There are many floodlights shining on the Washington Monument so we can see it in its splendor. We can see it in its beauty. And the idea of a floodlight is this. You're not supposed to pay attention to the light itself. You're to see what it is lighting up. And in fact, if your eyes are drawn away to a light that might not be working, that light is doing a bad job. It's not playing, it's not playing its part. It's not playing its role. Their job is to point to something else. And this is how the Holy Spirit works. He is not drawing attention to himself because his role is to draw attention and draw our eyes to Jesus. We saw that, to glorify the Son. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. So J.D. Greer, talks about it like this. There's a certain irony in how the Spirit works. J.D. Greer is an author and pastor. There's a certain irony in how the Spirit works. Whenever he is really present, you are not thinking about him. You're thinking about Jesus. So I've heard people say in the past that SMCC is not really one of those Holy Spirit filled churches because they're evaluating a church based on the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, based on some other things that happen in the environment. Whenever I hear that, I think to myself, that must grieve the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is okay being in the background as long as Jesus is in the foreground. And because at SMCC, we focus so much on who Jesus is, we glorify Jesus all the time. Because of that, we absolutely are a Holy Spirit filled church and place because of what Jesus taught about the role of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit uh, combats our sinful nature and sinful character. The Holy Spirit convinces us of truth by illuminating the truth of who Jesus is. Here's the third role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cultivates Christ-like character, cultivates Christ-like character in us. Look at Galatians. 
But I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. So he's saying walking in the Spirit, walking in the flesh, two ways to live life, two ways to behave, two types of character. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Of course, this is right there in the section where the Apostle Paul is gonna talk about the fruits of the Spirit, things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. The Spirit produces Christ-like character in each of us. Now, have you ever experienced one of these moments in your life? They're really frustrating moments where you are responsible for something or accountable for something, but you weren't capable for doing those things. I mean, maybe this has happened to you at work or at school or somewhere in, in your home. Uh, this happened to me my first year of junior college. Some of you don't know this. I, I started out in college thinking I wanted to be a doctor. Aren't you glad that didn't happen? Uh, I'm glad that didn't happen. Uh, started out, wanted to be a doctor, so I had to take some pre-med type courses. And so I'm in chemistry class at this junior college. And uh, I, was, I was accountable and I was responsible for balancing a chemical equation. To this day, I still don't even understand that concept, okay? I was accountable for it. I was responsible for it. I was not capable to do it. And when you are not capable for what you are accountable for, you are miserable. And I think this is why religion is so miserable for a lot of people. Because for a lot of people, religion is this. Look at how great Jesus is. He's so loving and he's so kind. Go be like him. To which we say, how could I ever be like him? I can't. It's like, well, try harder. It's like, well, I tried and I still can't get there. Well, I guess I'm not good enough. Religion is great at making people feel miserable because it says you're accountable and you're responsible for your holy life. And we go, well, I'm not capable of living that way. So I guess I'll be miserable in religion for the rest of my life. You don't have to live that way. I want you to know this. The Holy Spirit, when he enters into our lives, changes us from the inside out. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he over time brings us to a place where we are capable of honoring Jesus with our lives, not left to do it on our own, but able to take our next step to pursue a holy life because of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. It is true we are not capable, but the Holy Spirit is absolutely capable of producing holiness in us, Christ-like character in us. And this is why the gospel produces joy, not misery, because Jesus has not left us alone to follow after him. He's given us the Holy Spirit. The fourth role of the Holy Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit comforts us with salvation, comforts us with the truth of our salvation. I want to read this to you, two passages actually. In Ephesians, we see this, Ephesians chapter 1. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Listen, this is so important. You were included in Christ. You were placed into Christ. The moment you accepted the message of truth, you, you embraced salvation. And then look at what happens. When you believed, the moment you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the stamp of approval, this indicator that it's actually happened. And here's what it is. The promised Holy Spirit. The moment a person believes, the Holy Spirit enters into their lives. That's what we see here. And the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is given equally to all who trust Christ. There is not a second experience, a second experience where the Holy Spirit enters into a person. Sometimes it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a misunderstanding of this passage and the next one I'm about to read. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation to place us into Christ. Baptism means immersion. And the moment you trust Jesus, the Holy Spirit immerses you into Christ, brings you in to a relationship with him. The New Testament is not talking about a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a once experience for all who believe. That is good news. And that is very, very comforting. So there's a large group of people inside of a charismatic movement who think there's a second experience. That, I think, is a misreading of these passages that describe the role of the Holy Spirit 
And that role is at work the moment we believe. First Corinthians says it like this, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit, not just some, not just people who do extra things that look very interesting, not just certain activities inside of certain churches, but all, all were given uh, one spirit. Look at this. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we're all given the one spirit to drink. Nourishment comes from the Holy Spirit. It's the same for every believer on the face of the earth. Anybody who places their trust into Jesus the moment they believe, they are sealed. They are given the Holy Spirit. They are sealed with the Holy Spirit, which is, a, is a, really a symbol of saying, look, it's guaranteed. And that is very comforting. Here's the last part of today's message. The fifth role of the Holy Spirit in our lives now is this. The Holy Spirit curates gifts for the church. Curates gifts for the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, we read this. There are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it's the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Manifestation is a big word to say this. We're gonna see this happening. We're gonna see the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And how can we see it? It's through the gifts that God's people share with the body of Christ. See, a spiritual gift, really, that means a gift from the Holy Spirit as a behavior, an activity, a unique ability that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. But it's not a gift for you. It's a gift through you. But the gift really is to the local church. One of my favorite works of fiction is a book that really highlights a bunch of truth that's not fiction at all. Uh, one of my favorite books, it's a kid's book, uh, is, is this book. It's in the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And there's this one scene where the Christ character, Aslan, gives gifts through Father Christmas to the main characters, the children of Narnia. And uh, the gifts for Peter, it's a sword. For Lucy, it's some healing oil. And you think, this is interesting. What are these gifts for? They don't need these now. But what happens is that later on in the story, those gifts are the specific thing that they need for a specific moment. And I want you to think of your life like this, that if you've trusted Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in you and has curated some gifts that can come out of you for the local church for a moment like this. And if you're not using those gifts to serve the local church, look, we need it. Others need it. I need it. You have things that can love other people well. You have abilities and those abilities can be shared. It's how the Holy Spirit curates gifts for the church. So if we're going to sum up all five, here we go. Here they are. The Holy Spirit combats our sinful character, convinces us of truth, cultivates Christ-like character, comforts us with salvation and curates gifts for the church. I want these truths about the Holy Spirit to shape your story. It's easy to think, man, I... I just have not seen this in my life yet. I don't know if this is present in my life yet because of my story. I don't really know if the Holy Spirit's in me at all. Let's not go that route. Let's begin with what Jesus said. And when we embrace what he said, biblical doctrine rather than anecdotal doctrine, it changes the way we go about our story. So here's what it sounds like to take this fourth doctrinal statement and make it yours. It sounds like this. I believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit who lives in me and enables me to live a godly life. And I just wanna end with this. If you're struggling as you follow Jesus with sin, a sin that won't go away, a sin of addiction, I, I know what that's like. And if you're, if you're wrestling, if, you're, if you have doubts, if you have struggles, like, like I know what that's like. If you are fighting to follow after Jesus and it's just so incredibly difficult, I know what that's like. If there are lies that just scream at you inside of your head and those lies pull you away from Jesus and pull you away from joy, I know what that's like. If you're struggling to read your Bible and you're struggling to pray and you're struggling to show up at church and when you're here, you're so incredibly distracted and anxiety and worry and depression and all of that is happening. If you are in the fight, you have to know this. You do not go through any of that alone. If you are a Jesus follower, the Holy Spirit is in you, fighting for you, helping you, counseling you, convicting you, being your advocate, pushing lies out with truth, producing joy instead of worry. The Holy Spirit does that. And if you're thinking, Eric, that just sounds like a motivational talk. It's what Jesus said. 
And this is good news because there are days when I think to myself, I don't know if I can keep following. And then I'm reminded that the Holy Spirit is in me forever. And that's the same for you if you've trusted Jesus. You are not alone. Listen, you can do this. You can follow after him and have a vibrant faith full of devotion and delight. Not because of your power, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. So the bottom line of our message is this. Don't let your story shape your doctrine. Let this doctrine shape your story. Following Jesus who we can't see is intensely personal because of the Holy Spirit who helps us see. And the Holy Spirit in us is actually better than Jesus right in front of us because it's the Holy Spirit that makes Christianity so personal for millions of people. We can be grateful for that. Would you let this doctrine shape your story today. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for an opportunity uh, to follow you so personally because of the personal work, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. We're grateful for his work in our lives. And for those who feel discouraged and frustrated, lost and confused, may we lean on you and know the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, producing the next step process producing Christ-like character, comforting us with salvation. And because of all of that, I pray we would take our next step towards great joy in a relationship with you. It's because of the Holy Spirit that that's possible. We're grateful for that. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, before we go, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the hundreds of you that support SMCC financially each and every week. I get that finances are, are, are kind of a, a touchy thing and that the fact that there are hundreds of people who choose to trust their finances with God here at SMCC uh, just makes me so thankful and encouraged that we continue to provide hopeful and helpful content, not only at our locations, but also online for people as well. That happens because people are able to partner with us financially. So if you're one of those people, thank you so much for doing that. I so appreciate it. And if you would like to just know more about what that means to take that next step of partnering with us financially, you can do that by visiting smccutah.org slash give. Now, next week, we'll be back here again as we continue in our Redeeming Dogma series with Pastor Trevor as we talk about a subject that I think is pretty intriguing, is the topic of resurrection and eternity. We'll be talking about that here at SMCC Online and across our locations next week. I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Mm -hmm.